was trying to figure out what the hell is all the hype about. So I went on my Spotify and I was listening to like some of her songs. I was like, Anti Hero's a little bit of a jam. Sip and Chat Cafe. Welcome to Sip and Chat Cafe, a safe space for stimulating conversations. No topic is off limits. If it matters to you, it matters to us. I'm your host, Atara G, with our producer, Motown Maurice. For information about this podcast and more, please visit MotownMaurice.com. Today's episode unleashes an extraordinary person's resilient and inspiring journey. From being in the spotlight to battling seizures, and now the author of, yep, looks like she's ready, are you? A parent's go-to source for how to mindfully and consciously support kids in the arts. This transformational book touches on six key mindfulness principles for a happy journey in the arts and life. Please welcome Nicole LaShawn. Hello, Nicole. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm of excited. Course. You've had a diverse journey in the arts. You're a co- choreographer, an instructor, actress, an actress, model, a dancer, a model, musician, a musician. <laughs> so how how did like this love affair bloom or begin? <laughs> or when did you fall in love with the arts? Uh, so my journey began as a child, as many of our journeys do. Um, but I think I shot my first commercial when I was four. I believe four. And then I shot my second one when I was six. But at that time, I had already gotten involved in dance. So uh, originally, I do remember that I wanted to do gymnastics around the age of four or five. But um, for whatever reason, she my, my mother put me in dance and I just fell in love right away. And the program that I was in, I was a sucky dancer. Let me just be clear. <laughs> I was not that great. I was extremely flexible, but all children are extremely flexible if you understand how to continue to stretch them out along the way as they as they grow. Because you lose that flexibility. You can lose it by the age of six and five if you don't continue to use it. So that's what I did. And uh, she got me involved with the particular dance program. And it was okay. It was more recreational based. And it did what it was designed to do to teach me the flow of a class. And there's a lot of learning to do because when you're at that age, you're learning a heck of a lot of information in terms of like counting and memorization and like how your body operates, how you move and and that sort of thing with your coordination. So it was, I think it was, I was there for one or two years and then she switched me over to another, another dance studio And I ended up being at this studio for like eight or nine years. And that was the first studio that I started doing competition with. And it really got me involved in the dance world. And then by me saying dance world, I'm referring to, okay, if you want to do competition, you're going to have to take this many classes per week. Um, And then you take your like competition dances also per week. So it was a process, you know, it was a lot of money coming out. (laughs) And I was just so in love with the art of dance so much. So I believe before I even switched over to that uh, competitive studio, when I was just doing the one and two, two, one or two years of classes, when I first got started, I was already choreographing dances with my friends Mm -hmm. and choreographing things at home. And I know a lot of children do that, but for some reason, I just can't let it go. And so here we are uh, 40 years later, and I am still doing the same thing. Well, it brings you joy. So that's like a blessing to be able to continue something that brings you so much joy. Absolutely. Yeah. And in that, so you're doing... This, you're doing this dance and you're doing something that brings you so much joy. And then something happens where it's almost ripped from you. It's almost stripped away. Mm-hmm. What happens? So my senior year in high school was one of the most transformative years of my entire life. And 
although it was extremely exciting, it was also extremely fearful. And I was extremely fearful. Let me say it that way. Um, there was a lot of moving particles happening that I just didn't understand. And now I'm over it and, and all the things. However, at that time, I had one homecoming queen, which I didn't really participate in a lot of like government or anything of that nature with school. I was just a cheerleader and I was in band and that's all I wanted to do. So I won homecoming queen. Now I was no stranger to pageants and winning crowns because I had done a lot of these things my entire life growing up. However, a couple of people that were my friends um, didn't think I deserved to win. And so it caused a really big, they caused a really big uproar with the school. Um, there were numerous walkouts during my senior year because of this. There was, they called the news during the walkouts. Uh, parents got involved, restraining orders got involved, restraining orders against parents got involved, not even just against the students. Like it became a lifetime movie it was just madness and it didn't make any sense at all. So that was my senior year of high school. And it, although like it was one of the best years for me as a teacher, because I didn't know that I was going to be teaching just yet, but I was always the one in charge of all the choreography for everything that I was doing. Um, I was in charge of the, the cheerleading for the choreography for that, also editing the music for that, to getting everybody together. Even with band, I was drum major. So those couple people that didn't like the fact that I was homecoming queen was also in the band. And I remember when I went to band camp, this one time at band camp, I didn't tell anybody that this had happened. But uh, when we were walking or something, I lost consciousness, but it was for a millisecond. But I do remember it quite well. And I just kind of shrugged it off. You know, I was like, eh, maybe I tripped or something. I don't know. Um, so I kept you know, we kept walking. And later on that night when we went back to our rooms, it happened again. And did the same thing. I just shrugged it off and just thought that was that. So fast forward, I'm going into my freshman year of college. Uh, so I had auditioned for dance team and I made it. And I had actually auditioned for dance team and cheerleading at a couple different uh, universities. But the one that I chose, I made all of them. However, the one that I chose was in Indiana. Me and my mother and my father drove out to Indiana and they were going to drop me off um, for, for us to go to camp. And then I was going to stay with a girlfriend of mine that was also on the team for a week. And then my parents were going to come down and move me into the dorms. Seems like a pretty simple process after we figured it out. Okay, let's do this. So the night before we're supposed to leave for camp, I stayed up all night hanging out with my friends. Why? Because I was leaving. Because I knew I was going to college. You know, I didn't know, you know, it's a whole new world. So I'm, I'm here, I'm open, I'm available, let's do it. So I stay up all night. And then the next day, my parents drove me to um, where we were meeting for a dance team to leave to go to camp. We got there. We got in the parking lot. The cheerleading team is about 50 people deep. Like a lot, I would say people like cheerleaders. That didn't include the adults that had to go and the drivers. Like there was always a lot of cheerleaders. And so we get out the car. I'm just excited to be there. You know, I don't really know anybody, but this is a whole new world I'm stepping into. So I'm, I'm always excited for new adventures. And I get out the car and I remember losing my balance again, like before. And then next thing I know, I woke up in the ambulance. Oh. And I had a, a grand mal seizure in the parking lot in front of everyone. Yay. Welcome to the Nicole Show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a wild ride. So that happened. And that started a whole new, literally a whole new way of being in my life. And I think that was my turning point. Um, that was the first turning point. <laughs> and so as I went through school, I still ended up leaving and going to college. Now, I did have to see a neurologist, of course. And I did that. And we found a neurologist in Michigan because I did not go to camp that day. So we got in the car and turned around and drove our little asses back to Michigan. 
So you went. We went to the hospital and went, went back to, ho- to Michigan. How long were you in the hospital? It was just a few hours. A few hours. A few hours, and we drove right and back then to you Michigan. Went and drove back home. <laughs> wow, that sucked. So I'm familiar with a grand mal seizure very lightly. Mm-hmm. So what's the difference between a, a grand mal seizure and like a regular seizure? Seizure. Um, I know, right? Like, because a lot of people would consider that a regular seizure. I know I did for the longest, but there's different types. There isn't like a regular or an irregular. You know, there are some seizures where people's eyes are still open and they're still alert, but they just have no control over the muscle movement. I don't I don't know all the names of the different uh, types of seizures anymore. The one that I had, which was called a grand mal seizure, is when you do black out and you're completely like unconscious and the body just tremors and shakes. What they call it is a miss firing within the wiring of the brain. Okay. Ooh, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that started, you know, me having to be on medication to getting certain checkups every so often. And um, in this, in each, each state has different laws surrounding seizures. So in the state of Michigan, you are not allowed to drive for six months after your seizure. In the state of Indiana, it's three months, Mm -hmm. which is crazy to even think about. Like people don't even realize all these different things. Were you driving at that time? I was not. So you were about 17, 16? Yeah, I was, what was I? I was 17 17. because I was young, but we had, um, we had gotten out to meet with, like to find my coach because this was when like everybody was meeting in the parking lot and I was walking and I remember walking behind the car, like I'm going to get my stuff out of the trunk. And it, it was that fast. And then I woke up in the ambulance. And, uh, you know, my parents didn't know what to do. They were flipping out. Like, they didn't know. Nobody knew what was going on. As time went on, you know, I did have to continue to go see a neurologist every so often. And once we, I got settled in Michigan because, oh, I was going to school in Indiana. I was not going back to Michigan. So, um you know, I got in the neurologist settled and like everything kind of settled. And as, you know, one and two years passes, it it was really hard at first because that first year was um, getting used to that medication and the medication affects your coordination. And as a dancer, that is the hardest thing to do. And you don't really think that it's going to affect anything. But like I noticed that I was having trouble doing things like walking up and down the stairs which is scary to think about, right? Like just walk, like pick your foot up and move. But when it comes to like the wiring of the brain and the body movement, it's not that simple. (laughs) Was it the medication or was it the seizure that was causing you to feel different in your body? It was the medication. Medication. The medication, which is some powerful stuff. Let me tell you, anything for the brain is some serious stuff. Um, I know at first... The uh, neurologist in Michigan wanted me on like six pills a day. And my dad said, absolutely not. Wait, you, six different six, pills? No, six of the same pills uh, per day. But even still, like six is a ginormous a amount, right? Um, way too much. And so, you know, my father definitely stepped in and said, absolutely not. And we found, that's when we found the other neurologist in Indiana, which was near the school that I was going to. And um, he just had me on three. I never did the six at all. Never. Um, I only did the three. Did you have another another seizure? I haven't had any seizures. Mm-mm. Now, there was uh, what they call blackout, which is not a seizure. But so over the next five years, I had to stay on that medication because my EEGs were abnormal. And so what a black, the, those blackouts were similar to what I had my senior year in high school when I would like lose consciousness for a millisecond and regain it. Mm -hmm. So on those days was like, don't drive, don't do anything. So I did have a few afterwards and it was, it was hot. It was tough. It sounds scary. It it, It it is scary because at mm -hmm. any moment was, did you have any kind of like, if you kind of like how, you know, you wake up in the morning, you're like, Oh, this is probably maybe not a good example, but I'm going to start my period today. Mm-hmm. You kind of like, you, you can, you you can know. feel it. Mm-hmm. You know it. Is that how it was with the blackout? Mm-hmm. Would you have an idea that today might be a day? Not at all. And that's why they're so dangerous. That's why the the regulations are like, you know, no driving, no heavy lifting, no, you know, doing all the normal things. 
<laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely, it was a scary moment, but when you're in it, you're just trying to make it through. Survive through it. Yeah, yeah. you're, yeah. I wouldn't say I'm in total like fight or flight mode, but I just knew that I had to make it through. Like this mm-hmm. was not my destiny in life mm-hmm. at all. Yeah. And I just, yeah, something just was just kept propelling me to move forward. It's just that human spirit of like, I'm here on in this planet, in this body. Resilience, this is my being yeah. and I'm going to keep going. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's, I, <laughs> <laughs> I know everyone take a deep breath. Yeah. I was just like, you know, I know we've met before at Motown's. Um, mm-hmm. Late event. night experiment. <laughs> Late night experiment reunion. <laughs> Sorry. Um and I noticed you because you're very shiny. That's, like Aww. you're just very like you have an aura about you, mm-hmm. and you never. It just hearing your story and hearing you talk about this, you never would look at someone and imagine the hardships that they have gone through. You know that that have that they've gone through to get to this moment. And even looking at you now, I would never think. Not that I go around thinking, oh, I wonder what hardships this person went through. <laughs> but, you know, if someone said, guess, I would never think of that mm-hmm. because it's just so, you, like I said, shiny is the word I oh, like well, to thank use. You. Like shiny I'm and shining. just, you know. I'm shining. Um, yeah. Joyous, you know. Thank, I mean, that take, it's a daily practice. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into that yeah. in a little bit, into the, yeah. the, the daily practice of continuing to shine my light bright because it takes work. It's not. I mean, it's easy, but it takes work. It's an everyday yeah, practice. It's an everyday. It's practice. a deliberate everyday practice. But so looking back now, and I know there's other things that have happened as well. Mm-hmm. In addition to the seizure, mm-hmm. do you want to touch on those a little bit? Yeah, um, it was. I want to say, so I ended up having to be on that seizure medication for five years. So I started the seizure medication my freshman year of college. And so I ended up having to be on that medicine for five years, as I mentioned. In the process, <laughs> um, I had also had, uh, I want to say on like year five. Um, so I think it was like the same year that I found both of the, these two things out. So on year five, first let me um, state that I, you know, I went in for my normal checkups for the seizure. And by that time I had to get EEGs every three, every three months. So it dwindled to, it went from every six months. Ooh, it went from every six months to every three months. And then after that, it was just kind of like, only if you're feeling eh, then you need to get an EEG. But that only happened like one time. (laughs) So it was mostly like every three months. And I remember going and, um, going to get the EEGs and just that was a whole journey in and of itself. So the reason why I say it's a whole journey is number one, I have a lot of hair (laughs) and it doesn't seem like that should have anything to do with anything. But when you get the EEG, um, that's when they hook up all of the electrodes and the wires to your brain. And they tell you, come in with clean hair, no product in your hair, no product on your skin. So that means lotion, deodorant, you can brush your teeth. But, like, um, you know, I am African American, so no grease, no nothing. I was like, oh, this is gonna be fun. And so the first time I went was just blow my hair, you know, wash my hair, blow it out, because they want your head nice and clean. So I blew it out, and it, it's just everywhere. It's just all over the place. So the, literally the first time I went in there, the lady just looked at me and she's like, okay, so let's get started on hooking up the electrodes to your head. <laughs> and she had to part because what they do is they go in and they section out, section off your brain, basically. So they put glue on a certain spot and then they stick the electrodes to that. Um, so they're like the, mapping it out. Yeah, so okay. she had to map it out. And it's almost like uh, the only way that I can describe it, the way it was feeling was like a snap. So they put the little glue stuff on it and then put the bottom part on it and then they snap it on. Mm-hmm. Now, I got a lot of hair. I'm not saying I got a big head, but I'm saying it took about an hour and a half just to do that. We're not even at the EEG yet. <laughs> like, And now the EEG is not a fun process for the one that I was the reason why I was going, um, in the EG, they make me hyperventilate, which is never fun to do that on purpose. Um, they also, you know, flash, uh, light 
in front of your in front of your face and i don't know if you've noticed at all like when you're watching tv or seeing a video or something and lights are flashing they'll give a pre-warning that says you know please do not watch if you uh have a you know if you have seizures or any sensitivity to light i never had any sensitivity to light i was fine however getting this eeg always uh proved differently and otherwise so Every single time I got the EEG test done, it was always the same test. Come in looking a mess, number one, <laughs> and mess my hair up and get glue all over the place. And it was always my front, front right on my front right section of the brain that was always abnormal. And I mean, like I honestly, like deep down, like deep down, you always know what the issues are when you really get to the root of what is going on. And <clears throat> I didn't question it too much at that time because I wasn't that involved into like studying the brain yet. Um, however, it, it was showing that, you know, it was the frontal low or the front right section. And, you know, they always say like it's stress and the blah, blah, blah. and people say stress all the time, but that can go so big. And it's so that's so general. But there's so many moving particles that attribute to stress. Right. And yeah. So after about five years of this madness, um, I would even say after three years, I regained my coordination back. And, or I just had to figure out a way. So you re you were able to regain your coordination mm -hmm. while still taking the medication? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. while still taking the medication. And at that time, I was also on birth control pills. <laughs> and because the seizure medication was the way that it is, I had to be on the highest dosage of estrogen for birth oh, control Lord. pills. Lord, I felt like I was a walking time bomb. <sighs> Like, and I was more so only on the pills to regulate my cycle because I had been so athletic my entire life. Um, you know, like a lot of gymnasts are on this, it's the same way to regulate your cycle so you can have a cycle. Like, uh, so, you know, this thing we call life in this human body is such a gift <laughs> um, to be grateful for, even with it, you know, not functioning the way we think it should function. It really technically is functioning the way that it should be. Well, oftentimes when we think our body is broken or we think it's in pain, mm -hmm. it's actually in the process of fixing itself. Correct. You know, and because as human beings, we don't know how to go and sit down and be <laughs> quiet and give Thanks. our body a chance to fix itself. We're like, oh, my ankle's broken. That's OK. I'm still going to, you know, <laughs> this one here, my foot hurts. I'm still going to go play basketball <laughs> five days a week and then comes home limping like, oh, my leg. I'm like, well, you know, even animals know that when they don't feel well they will go just sit go down. sit down and lay down and let their body heal themselves mm -hmm. no matter how long it takes mm -hmm. you know that's that it's that caveman mentality yeah. of like stay up late work harder do what you gotta do it's sorry it's that masculine energy sorry i'm just saying <laughs> men i out. love you <laughs> yes it's not always necessary to grind it out it really isn't it, yeah, it's, it's, it's necessary to grind will do it that out. To you. Huh? <laughs> Capitalism will do that to you. Absolutely. It'll put you in that mindset. I concur. Yeah. So I had the, uh, about the third year in was, that's when everything was happening in terms of me being on that seizure medication. And uh, going into that fifth year, I went to the neurologist, the same old, same old, just for regular checkup. Um, and I had gotten an EEG before that, like, so I was going in to get the results. The normal thing, because I don't like that this was a normal thing, number one, but it's the normal thing. So I get there, and she sits me down, and we're talking, like, how's your day going? And so uh, she says, let's go over to your test results, so your EEG. And she starts reading through it, and it's all negative. Negative, negative, negative. Like, everything's come, all the results are coming out negative. And I was like, wait. When she said the first negative one, she's like, okay, so the frontal right low portion came out negative. And then she started reading. I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Stop. Freeze. Pause. What did you just say? Negative is good. Negative right? is good. Negative, negative is means good. there's okay. no problem being found. Yeah. And so I was like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Stop the press, everyone. What did you just say? And she's like, yeah, your results turned out to be negative in that, you know, in that frontal right lobe area. And I was like, you must be 
you gotta be shitting me, right? <laughs> was this the first time you had come in to a full negative test? First time in five years. Wow. First time. So that also meant that I did not have to be on the medication at all. Were you doing anything outside of the Western medicine to help with your own healing? I had started the process, but I didn't really like start the process. So, you know, I had to start, well, I was already an athlete. So I, all I did was kind of like turned it up a notch and started working out more. And I had shifted the way I ate just a little bit, but it was still pretty unhealthy. But to the average Joe Schmo that eats, you know, junk all day long, they would assume I'm healthy, but nah, uh, I thought I was doing the right thing, but it's a part of the process, you know, it's a learning process. So that happened. And right around that same time I had, um, was having, I went for a run one day. I don't know why I wasn't a big runner. I'm not going to lie. So I go for a run the next day I'm sitting at work and I notice my, uh, like leg is kind of shaking a little bit. And I'm like, uh, okay, I just got through with the entire body shaking. What are you doing knee? And <laughs> Uh, come to find out, that's when I found out I had to have surgery, knee surgery. And <laughs> it's like one thing after another. Uh, it seemed that way at that time. And so I did, I had to get a major scope done on my knee, in which case they, they go in on one side with an instrument to take out the dead cartilage and like if any chipped bones are there. Um, they go in and take the junk out on one side and then with the other side, they go in with the camera so they can see everything. Had you injured your knee? No. Nope. Prior? No. Nope. I hadn't injured my knee. I was a full-on gymnast, cheerleading, all the things. And it was just that simple run brung it out. I didn't hurt myself on the run. This was just the next day. I noticed it was shaking. And so over the next couple of weeks, you know, I made an appointment. We got the x-ray done. And then come to find out there was, you know, some torn cartilage and stuff swarming around in there that they wanted to take out. And so we made this scheduled appointment to get the surgery. And that was really fun. <laughs> and so now you're about, you're in your 20s at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah, I'm okay. in my 20s. My 20s, okay. I is in my 20s. And I will say um, after the surgery, typically a lot of my a lot of my friends that are athletes they've had you know scopes done on their ankles and different other body parts and they're fine within a couple of days you know you're it sucks at first cuz it, it sucks after surgery any surgery <laughs> like those first couple of days but after that you know the body begins the body's always in the process of healing and after i had this scope done after a couple of days something wasn't right <laughs> And come to find out, I don't know if this was done by mistake or not, but I could not bend my leg at all. So the muscles that you use to hold your, to keep your leg straight and to lift it straight, even if it's just like to lift it up to like get in the tub or like to put your shoe on as you're standing, I couldn't do. So I couldn't bend it at all. So you go to work, it starts shaking, and then it just kind of declines from there. Uh, well, no, it, like I was... It was okay. Like I would still go to work. It would shake a little bit, but I could move it and bend it and whatnot. And I was still teaching dance at that time too. I was teaching dance full time and I had a full time, you know, nine to five. And then I, afternoon evenings, I go teach dance. That's always been my, my life. And um, yeah, so fast forward a couple of weeks, I had the knee surgery and I couldn't bend my leg at all. So simple tasks like sitting on the toilet was great. I don't know how many times I broke the 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 toilet holder that's on the wall. That is not <laughs> the <a> railing. <laughs> Child, that thing got PSA. broke numerous times. There's so many holes in that wall. <laughs> I'm re putting it back on. But yeah, that was not fun. Everything even, you know, getting in the tub to stand up and shower isn't fun at all because I could not bend it, not even an inch. Well, it's exhausting. I have arthritis and I was in track and field and mm -hmm. I have arthritis in my knees. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, some days when it flares up, you're in a lot of pain, but the pain just caused like this full body physical exhaustion. Yeah. So not only do you have to deal with the pain, you have to just deal with being tired, mm -hmm. worn out from the pain. So, and then trying to like continue to go to work, teach yeah. dance, 
be a human being, live a full life. I just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, I want to be a dog. I'm not into this anymore. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so you're, it is psychologically draining. And I had just come off of a psychologically draining <laughs> last five years, uh, which I did graduate college, by the way. So I did graduate. Yay! <laughs> And I was back on the dance team. This is all before college. And, you know, I did I did manage to. We went to camp again in California, and I did make it. Lord have mercy. I made it. I made it. So fast forward. I've said fast forward 800 times, but we just going to brick a brick and fast forward again. Um, you know, I had the knee surgery, and I could not bend my leg. And so my parents came down when I had the surgery. Uh, my father stayed for a day. <laughs> my mom stayed for the next couple weeks, but, you know, my dad did have to get back to work and that sort of thing. Uh, but I, driving was fun. I started back driving about a week later because um, I am I you know, I drive with my right foot and I had knee surgery on the right knee. That was really great. <laughs> Try breaking when you can't bend your leg. But eventually through physical therapy and whatnot, you know, we got me to be able to, got the leg to be able to bend again. And the brunt of my physical therapy was riding a bike. And I mean, I don't mind riding bikes now. It's cool. But for a minute, I was staying away from bikes because having to bend and go around in that circle, like it took, it probably took a month of physical therapy to be able to go a quarter of the way, to go a quarter of the, like, talk about pain. But then after y'all you know, was able to go that like quarter of the way, it was just kind of like I had a conversation with myself and my knee and it was, okay, we're not going to get stuck in this position forever. We're going to have, you know, we got to make some changes. And it was a full on conversation. And because of the, I won't just say determination, like work harder, because it wasn't that. It was making peace with what is mm -hmm. and taking the necessary steps to improve my physical health within, like the health within. So not just the knee, but like what I'm eating and that sort of thing and slowing the mind down and thinking and that's what really did it. And I was out of physical therapy. I was supposed to be there for three months, but I was out in two. So mind over know. matter is a real thing. It sure you know, is. Especially when it comes to your physical health mm -hmm. and you can will yourself better. I really do. Mm -hmm. I really do feel that. Mm -hmm. I am right there with you when it comes to the knee pain. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I used to suffer from earaches when I was a little, when I was a child. And that was the most painful thing. Even as an adult, I think I never had anything more painful than an earache. Mm. But when I talk about the knee pain. I had them earaches too. Child, that, near pain, that knee pain is a whole nother level of pain. I mean, it. your knees are like core to your bodily function and they they bear so much of the weight. And when they're not working, it's, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's. <laughs> it is definitely yeah, something yeah. to to think about and give gratitude for yeah. every day. Thank you for my knees. Yep. Thank you for my elbow. Thank you for my back. <laughs> exactly. That's another big yeah. one. Every every part of the body yeah. is is so imperative. So when you look back now on your journey um, through all this physical hurdles, mm -hmm. what do you think or what do you believe? Is because a lot has happened to you, you know, in a short period of time. Um, what do you believe is the root cause of this? I don't think there's one particular root cause. I think it's a combination of all the life experiences and how we calculate it in our minds to to be, you know, the 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 different life experiences to, you know, the friends that you hang with, to what you see on TV, to being in cars, like it, all these different things that we experience, you know, whether it be a car accident, losing loved ones to, you know, falling and breaking your arm to all these, all these different things that we go through in the human experience, because we're here for the human experience, right? Is I, I believe that that's what really caused it and what, what, what the trigger was. Part of that trigger is the stress in home life and, you know, having a parent with substance abuse didn't help. So, 
you know, some might say, some may say I chose to do performing arts to get out of the house. And that is part of it. However, I was madly in love with performing arts and entertainment. Like at that early age of, was it four, three? Just, you can tell me nothing. I don't care. I'm going to dance class. It, I don't, I don't care what you say, what you say. I got class. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to the movies. I got class. So, you know, a lot of it had to do with, uh, just dealing with the, the substance abuse and trying to, as a child, you're trying to understand your parents and you can't because first of all, the logic within the brain, it really doesn't completely settle until ages six to eight. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot happening that you're still, you're just trying to, you're just trying and you're from birth up to ages six to eight, you're only learning through vibration and observation period. And so with having the seizure and all that, that introduced me into studying the mind more and studying the brain. And there's a small portion of me that believes I should have went into like being a neurologist or <clears throat> being a neurologist or something of the sort, but I didn't. I chose dance instead, but. <laughs> well, it sounds like when you're interested in something, you get passionate about it that and part. you pursue it. So mm -hmm. If something's happening to you and it has to do with your brain, you seem like the kind of person who wants to know all about it. Because you, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking to myself, she sounds like she knows a lot. When you're talking about the front part, mm -hmm. it's like, it seems like she knows a lot about your uh, her own brain mm -hmm. or brains in general and how they function. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you studied, you did your own study on the brain. I did. I, I, I don't want to say I didn't have a choice, but, you know, we all have these things within us sometimes that are propelling us to move forward. And that kept propelling me to like take matter into my own hands. And I will say the one thing that I can remember that was the driving force was my freshman year of college. I was in a big lecture class. So, you know, one of those classes where we had like 500 seats, it was an auditorium, one of those. And I don't even remember the name of the course, the class. However, I know he had us read a book and the book, it was like something with culture or something. The, the class was something about culture or something, but the book had to deal with um, a culture that was not from, it was a family from a different culture that wasn't from America. And in their family, they had a little baby. Like I think it was, I think it was a three or four month old. Mm -hmm. And ironically, she kept having seizures. It's not that that's ironic, but it's ironic that I had the seizure my freshman year of college. And then I get in this class, my freshman year of college, first semester, it's like the first class of the day. And, <laughs> and he had us reading this book and it was like, I'm reading and I'm just taking it in. And the, and the basis of the book talked about how this family that came from another country into the American culture and the, the, child kept having these seizures, grandma seizures, but was having at least 10 a day. Oh, wow. So at some point it became like 20 a day, which is really like, I had one and it's a lot for the body to go through. Like you're sore afterwards. You don't, you know, you, there's so many things that go into having a seizure that you have to be aware of. Like I almost bit my tongue half off. Um, I didn't have to get stitches, but I did have to, you know, it was, it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's so many different moving particles that most people just are not aware of. So in this book, um, you know, this little baby, a, a baby, not even six months old was having almost 20 seizures a day. Um, and you know how precious their brain is mm -hmm. and soft it is also because everything is informed yet. Right. So in the book, the book talked about how through changing the baby's eating habits, they were able to slow down the seizures to eventually stop the, the stop the seizures. And I just thought that was so fascinating. And it was just, just that simple. Didn't have to be on tons of medications because that's the thing. She couldn't do, take a lot of medications. She didn't have teeth. She didn't like, so they had to figure out a different way to get whatever into her bloodstream. And anytime anything dissolves within the mouth, which is the actually one of the pills that I had for a seizure was, um, and the headaches was it would dissolve in your mouth, but it gets to the bloodstream faster. So that's what they were giving her. And um, 
just, they were doing it through foods though. And so it was, you know, them, whether them like blending and even if it was like, they, they put her on a high fat diet. This is interesting. <laughs> a friend of mine, her son has autism mm-hmm. and um, she improved. He did not speak. I think the first time he said my name, he was 16. Mm. I was getting out of the car. I, I was getting in the car to leave. And he's like, bye, Atara. I almost. He's like, wait a minute. Wait, 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 what? And she had put him on. She had changed his diet. Mm-hmm. And it helped with his brain function. Mm-hmm. And he started talking and doing a lot of other things, too. So I'm sure my diet growing up attributed to that. It's attributed to the seizure. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, like, as parents or supporters just you do the best that you can Mm -hmm. you know and had we known you know that I shouldn't be having xyz after class or whenever then that wouldn't been the case you know so it's it's interesting just to look back on all the things (laughs) how have you changed your diet like I know you're into juicing because (laughs) well you guys don't know but I know when Nicole came over today we juiced some ginger and apples. apples. So you have fresh squeezed ginger juice and apple juice. What are your favorite apples again? Um, I think honey crisps are my favorite. Yeah, these are favorite the honey apples. crisps. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So in addition to the juicing, mm-hmm. what other changes have you made? The food was the biggest thing. Um, I would say after after I had the knee surgery, <laughs> um, something else happened, and that really kicked into an effect like what I was eating. And what did happen was that a lump was found in my breast and ended up having it removed. It was benign, like everything was fine, but that also was piquing my interest. So it was it was a combination of, as I was saying earlier, it's like all the things that placate into you making your change and your shift. So it was me reading that book my freshman year in college, and then the whole knee surgery and seizure thing was like, wow, I got to heal my body. Like what is going on? Um, what are the best modalities to healing? So then, then we found a lump in my breast and it was like, if I am healthy, somebody please tell me this is not the definition of health. Like what is really going on? Do you think that lump was from the estrogen you were taking? As I, I can never attribute anything to one thing. If, mm-hmm. I want to say it's a combination of all things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be, could have been the extra estrogen to the stress levels to, you know, who knows, honestly. Yeah. Um, but I did get that removed. But that was scary, you know, going in for just the biopsy and then let alone getting the surgery. And then they got to take the stitch out because they didn't give me like one. You know how sometimes you see it on TV at at sometimes and you may have had stitches, but you'll have like numerous stitches. Mm -hmm. This was not numerous stitches. This was one long stitch around my around the areola area. Uh. And so putting it in is one thing because it's numb, but taking it out, I wanted to punch the doctor in the throat and the face (laughs) <laughs> and How the many chest. years ago is this? Oh, child, this would have been in like ew, 2005, five okay. or four. Because I had a papilloma removed from, mm-hmm. from my breast, and they had to stitch right along, all right along the areola, man. Mm-hmm. And even just looking at it is painful. Mm-hmm. But the stitches kind of they just dissolved. See, I ain't it wasn't Why? that long ago, but it was still like. So th- think, uh, men and women, we all have nipples, do we not? So <laughs> halfway around was the length of the stitch. So That's... they had to, he said, I'm going to pull it on the count of three. No. So let me tell you, he said one, two, and started pulling. He pulled that old trick on me. I was like, but not, you can't pull it out fast. So that, talk about excruciating pain. Yeah. like. And then it, it's probably healing on the stitch. So it's like. I don't even want, and she's going into detail know, and sorry. all the things. Sorry, so y'all. Terrible. Mm, mm, so terrible. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, that that <laughs> definitely hurt. Um, I, I persevered. I made it through. <laughs> Girl. My I boob just... is still in great, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> so. I want to say after that, that was kind of the final straw. And I was like, I've had it with everything. The doctor bills, all all the blah, 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 because I'm just in a rat race right now. And not no one is helping me. And I know, I genuinely know the answers to what I am 
searching for and seeking, I have already. But like, how do you how do you get those answers? What do you do? What do you do? So uh, as I continue to study, and I can say this now, but what was hindering me at the time, and it hinders many people, is we continue to ask disempowering questions. And so you receive a disempowering answer just because of the law of attraction. So it's, it's like gravity. It does exist. You're not like using it. It just exists. So I started understanding. Now, at that time, I didn't under I didn't know. I hadn't heard about this disempowering, empowering, blah, blah yet. But I did begin to ask the right questions. Just I've just just trial and error and trying to figure things out and how to be more gentle with myself yeah. and take care of my own body because I'm the only one that can. Amen. Amen, Amen. sister. Amen. I feel you so much on this. And I, I, we're going to take a quick break mm-hmm. and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about Nicole's book and we're going to get into the law of attraction and some other juicy stuff. So sit tight and we'll be right back. <laughs> what people don't realize is that our ancestors were revolutionaries. So if you have Haitian blood, running through your veins. You too have the DNA of revolutionaries. The revolution will not be televised, but it will be streaming. You just heard a snippet of the six-part docuseries, Audacity of Host, which explores the Haitian American experience of Motown Maurice. You don't want to miss it. Audacity of Host is streaming now on Tubi. For more information, visit MotownMaurice.com. And we're back. So, Nicole. Yes. Your book, yep, looks like she's ready. Are you? I want to know, what is the motivation behind your book? Oh, child. You know, every story has a story. (laughs) So, besides my life story as my motivation, um, when I was, I remember... One evening, I was laying in bed with my ex-fiance, and we were watching, I think it was HBO or one of those shows, I mean, one of those networks, and in the show, the show followed these extremely talented children that were, like, experts at what they did, like an expert golfer at the age of six. Like, what? Uh, uh, You know, expert gymnasts to expert football players and their parents were their coaches. Hmm. So that intrigued me a little bit because there was a point where, you know, my father became really, really strict with our upbringing and our activities and particularly um, our musical instruments. So I was a flutist for 20 years. Uh Uh-oh. I was in band too and I played the flute. Yes. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I still got it, by the way. I will never give it up. That is my baby. I don't Uh have mine. I honestly don't know what happened to it. That's okay. I loved it. It's missing you and it's, it's just cherishing the time you guys spent together. I could still feel the Mm -hmm. way the um, pads feel when you hit and mm-hmm. hit the buttons, but I digress. So you were a flutist. <laughs> I am a flutist. It is at home right now. So yeah, there were, I remember there were quite a few times and moments where my father would like make us stay in our room and practice for hours on, on end. Now they had gotten me and my brother actually involved in private lessons. And I started private lessons at the age of like seven or eight. And then band started at the age of 10, I think, 10 or 9. So, you know, I was always like one level above everyone else when it came to playing my, you know, playing the flute. And even like in middle school, I had to be in like the next grade up band, if that makes sense. So like seventh grade, I was in like the eighth grade band or I'd have to walk over to the high school. Um, so it was, but but I actually genuinely love to play. And, you know, I always thought there's no need to like make us stay in the room and practice because I like, I like all this stuff. I like to play. However, although that seems like a negative, um, it, in some sort of way, it did become a positive because it still just made me better, you know, and whether you want to call it me being a servant or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, I, I always try to 
downplay my my playing around my peers, but I can play great. Like even now, like I can still really play. I think a lot of times I don't touch it just because of the memories that it it brought back and I didn't go into detail on all, all the things and like the forcibility of it all, but you know, like I I love I love all the things when it comes to performing arts and me playing my my flute and and that sort of thing. But I think I gotten off the topic a little bit, so let's bring it back. Oh, start smart for the arts. Yes, here we go in the book. Okay, okay. So bring it back to the book. So I was watching this show one night, and the show talked about you know the 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 harsh uh, training that the parents were giving these children. And I just, in my brain, it was like, you know, there has to be, there's nothing out there to help parents with with guiding their kids through performing arts and entertainment. Nothing. Um, besides, you know, talk to this person, they can get you in and word of mouth sort of thing. But there's nothing out there available to to help guide the process of it, not necessarily to get them on the show, but the process of getting involved. And so through meditation and and just guidance on like what was coming in like the information that I was receiving I created an online platform for parents and it guides you through how to get your little ones started in performing arts and entertainment and sports so even if whether they're just now starting or they want to pursue this like they want to continue it or pursue it as a career it's it's more so guidance on how to get involved how to move to the next level the big ones are how to save time and money because everybody wants to do that but the most imperative aspect of the program talks about how to hmm talks about your thoughts and how to move thoughts around in your own mind to feel better on purpose because that affects your health it affects your entire life and the goal of it is not just for the kids so the book is for adults people look at it and think it's for children and i'm like uh uh-uh, uh this is for you this is a a book that is for adults it's more of a a guidance as to how to move thoughts around in your own mind to feel good on purpose and then that just transfers over into your kids and how to teach it though I do talk about how to teach it and then I do go into how to apply it to how you're raising them, how to apply it to putting them in different activities throughout their life. Like it it honestly can be applied to anything. I am just such a performing artist, like that's the audience that I gravitate to and same vice versa. But it can be for you know, if your son or daughter is a artist, if they like to play in the mud, sure. Like all these, the things that are in the book are universal principles that never change and always exist. And it's not something that's like very fly by night and popular today, not popular tomorrow. These are universal principles that are forever and will always remain. And to be able to share that with those that are like me and are not like me and to be able to help be a guiding light on someone else's journey is the only reason why I did it, you know, I, when I created it, I remember coming across a quote that said, um, I forgot what it was, the exact topic of it, but the quote mentioned for every one person that has this information, you have the ability to affect at least 700 lives. And I read that. And when you first hear it, you're like, yeah, okay. And then as I created the program, I'm, you know, I'm going deeper and deeper and I'm like, okay, okay, this is going to be online. So it can reach people. I, I can see that. So I put that in the program and, and then as I'm talking about it and like, you know, as I'm changing how I think and how I be in this world or be of this world, you know, my parents are noticing, my brother's noticing, you know, I changed my eating habits and so they're asking questions now. And then eventually my mom had the shift also. So then she's like, uh, it was after, it was for Christmas. I gave her a gratitude box where I, I decorated it and filled it with mm. a bunch of like uh, quotes, little pieces of paper that you open up and there's a quote, there is a quote on each page. And it's just something cute and little. And I gave one to her and my sister-in-law and my mom was in HR. And so People come to her with problems all the time, you know, HR. And she was able to like help people feel better and have them pull from the gratitude box because she took it to work because 
because she just took it to work. She felt like doing it. And so I, I began to see the shift that it makes. And even, you know, the dance studio, I was teaching that because I changed my eating habits. I was always having an apple. I'm just going to say it. I eat like two apples a day. And, you know, the parents began to notice during class. And then I started to see less McDonald's and Burger King being brought into the studio. And because they were always asking me, like, you know, what happens, you know, what food supplies what to the body? And we noticed that you're eating X, Y, Z all the time. So, like, what's that all about? And as I mentioned, like, I started seeing a difference in how the kids were eating, which is affecting their behavior Mm -hmm. as well. And it was affecting the parents' behavior. That's not most importantly, but it kind of is most importantly because, you know, the kids will follow Mm -hmm. uh, whatever the parents are doing. So I was seeing the shift for sure. This, do you touch on, because I wonder how does a a parent identify when they have an artistic child or when they have a child who may be, a very young child who may be interested in arts? Because you said something that interested me about how to, you know, how to guide someone through their life. Because I, my parents, they raised me, they housed me, they clothed me, they fed me, but I didn't really get any guidance on what to do with myself after high school. And the one thing I did want to do, which was go to art school, was like, shut down pretty quickly (laughs) my aunt was like well what are you gonna do with an art degree yeah so I was like okay I guess that's over (laughs) but I've always I've always wanted I've always wished that I had someone who had noticed oh Atara's interested in these things I noticed she enjoys these things and then when it was time for me to go to college or pursue you know activities outside of school to like push me in that direction or guide me in that, or even suggest maybe think about this, maybe think about that. Mm -hmm. Does the book kind of talk about, cover an aspect of that or how to do that or how to approach that with a child? Absolutely, it does. The book absolutely does cover and touch on that. You know, it goes into different exercises that you can just do with your little one, not necessarily for the purposes of finding what they're good at, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it's just to have fun. Like the goal of all of this, even this life experience, in my opinion, is to have fun. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so there's different exercises and modalities in the book for adults to begin thinking about and thinking about those things within themselves first. And then it transmutes into, you know, paying that, uh, paying attention to your child or whoever it is that you're supporting and what it is they're doing, what they're interested in, because you can just just watch and observe and see what they're interested in, how they be on a normal basis, Mm -hmm. the types of things that they like to do. Uh, And, and, you know, then you can take it to a next level, buy something from the store and see, you know, if they're interested in that. And it's not really about forcing them to do anything, but just seeing what sparks their joy. I like that you say it's about finding, for the parent, finding that in themselves first. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, as I think about it, maybe what we don't think about for ourselves and give to ourselves, maybe we're not always able to give that to those around us. You know, if we're not doing it for ourselves, we're probably not able to do it Mm -hmm. for anyone else. Mm -hmm. So I do, that's a good point. I know the one thing I do stress in the book is, you know, you have to become what you now know. (laughs) <laughs> and the only way to truly, truly lead is through the clarity of your example. There's no way around it. Uh, you know, even my parents have been guilty of this, of like, you know, well, just do what I say. Mm-hmm. But when you're demonstrating something completely different in the household, it's hard for a growing brain to differentiate the two. I mean, you see the difference, but to really transmute it into your life, it's hard to do because you only know what you see. Mm -hmm. And the brain is still growing all the way through age 26. And people forget this Mm -hmm. as, you know, we're considered adults at the age of 18, 21, but the brain is still growing. That is, means a lot. But think about that. Like you wouldn't send a three month old out to be on their own. No, you wouldn't. (laughs) Even let's say, you know, the logic begins to kick in around, ages six to eight. So you wouldn't send a nine-year-old out to be on their own just because the logic has kicked in. Like 
it's kind of a no brainer when you think about <laughs> it, but we have a lot of really big expectations with like 21 year olds and they just graduated college. No, they don't know what they they're doing should yet. know. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you've said a couple of things that remind me of mindfulness mm-hmm. and I started studying mindfulness Um, I had a crisis and I went to therapy and I learned about mindfulness and I actually stopped going to therapy and just started immersed myself in mindfulness, which has really done a lot for my personal mental health and spiritual well-being and all of that. Um, And I noticed that Michael Beckworth, who is the minister and founder of Agape International Spiritual Center, wrote the foreword for your book. He did, yay. And I know he's also an advocate for the law of attraction, which you had mentioned before we went to the break. So how did he um, end up writing the foreword to your book? Well, he, first of all, I go to Agape. So that's where I attend spiritual service. I will attribute that to my ex who brought me into the world of Agape. I'm going to have to have you back for another (laughs) podcast because I need to hear about this ex. (laughs) Now, I will say, I will say, during my awakening process, I had heard, I had seen a clip of, I call him Rev, but Michael Beckwith online. And I had heard about the whole The Secret, the movie The Secret, and I was like, eh, whatever. Um, But I had, you know, my awakening journey started with me changing, like, my eating habits. And uh, let's say sometime into that, I was seeing my ex at that time and he had, he was living out here and I was in Michigan and he wanted to know if I could pick up something from his mom cause they live in Detroit. So if I can pick that up and then uh, bring it when I was coming out this way. And so I said, sure, I'll do that. So I went over to his mom's house and I picked up his mail or whatever it was. And then she gave me an envelope and she was like, oh, here, you can have this. Now this is the first time I met her. So it was already a weird thing, like me going over there like, uh, hi, I'm this person that your son's dating. <laughs> like, uh, So, yeah, so I went over there. Her and I sat and chatted for a little bit. And then she, we right before I left, she said, here, I have this envelope. You can have it if you want to. I typically like like to pay it forward a lot of times. I don't know what's in this envelope. If she could have had a rabbit's foot, a, a apple, a sock, I I couldn't tell you. So anyways, I get to my car and I'm like, what's in this envelope? I'm scared. Should I, should I not open it? Is it going to like, what's going to happen? So I open it and there's a book. Now, let me preface this with when I saw online, like a little bit of the secret and I ran across uh, Michael Beckwith's face, you know, I had seen, you see advertisements online all the time. You do. You see pop-ups and all the things. And there was some some little pop-up that was advertising, some book, and there was a little blurb about it. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was not a book reader nor writer at all. But I will choreograph all day and edit music in my sleep or do commercials and all the other things. But I was not into reading books. I was not into writing. Nope, nope, nope. So, anyways, I see this thing online and I'm like, eh, it'd be interested in, in reading that. And it was a blurb about a book. And I was like, okay, I'd be interested in reading that. But that's all I said. And it was on to the next, like, let me find this music for class. Cause I got class later. So anyways, uh, I'm, I, I'm in my car and I opened this envelope. So that had happened like a couple months ago. Okay. So I'm now in the car and I'm opening this envelope and wouldn't you believe it? It was that exact <laughs> book from that advertisement a few months ago. And I was like, I have never said I'd be interested in reading any book except for that one book. And here it is in this envelope. So I started looking around. It's like, I didn't tell anybody. It was just a, you know, you see stuff online all the time and you just click off. I'm going to have to give you a list of things that I need in my life because your manifestation powers (laughs) are far superior to mine. (laughs) Oh, my God. That was the point to when I really started. I was like, okay, there's something else going on here. Something else is happening. And so... It was, that was the one thing. And then, so I get out here and, you know, I'm spending time with him and I tell him about this whole book and all of that. And that was that. And then he had asked me to go to church with him. I said, okay, I don't know nothing about nothing. He didn't say no names about anything. So I just say, okay, I'm here to support you, of course, because he was getting his doctoral degree. So I had been 
you know, reading his dissertation and like doing all the things, but he was graduating from USC. Mm -hmm. So Sunday comes and we get ready for church and we're late because of Nicole and we get there and we have to sit in like the outside area because it's that packed. And I was like, oh, what is this? And then I think at one point we did go inside. Like we managed to like squeeze in and go inside. And I saw like dancers on stage. Now, you know, I was all in <laughs> once I saw people dancing on stage. I was like, wait a minute. And it wasn't cheesy liturgical. Sorry for those that do liturgical. But it wasn't like face. I don't even want to say. It wasn't the normal. It was just regular dancing to mm -hmm. me. Like technical, more technical stuff. And you could tell that the girls, the dancers had technique. And I was like, okay. What is this? What is this? So then after that, then the guy came out to speak. The reverend came out to speak. And long and behold, it was Michael Beckwith, who I had seen a little bit of clip of. And then I had heard about The Secret. And then I ran across that book. And it was just like these sequence of events. You cannot make this stuff up. And I was kind of like sold right there with uh, Agape. So... <laughs> As time went on, my ex and I continued our relationship, and I made the move to come to California in 2010. That's when I moved here. Because I was still living in Michigan, and he was out here. Mm. And so I'm here, and then, you know, we go to church on Sundays, and every now and again I see the dancers. And I just remember saying to myself, but out loud to myself, you know, looking like I'm talking to myself in service, Oh, I will be dancing on that stage and I will be choreographing because this is what I do. Like once Nicole is involved in something, I don't want to say I take over, but it has a way of me being in charge. You take over. Just go ahead and say it, girl. I take, I'm okay. a Leo. I'm just going to oh, attribute it to being damn. a Leo. My, <laughs> <laughs> my sister's a Leo and my father's a Leo. Well, you know, so we're, we we're a good company, Motown. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. You are a great company. I'm a fire sign. So, um... Yes. So that started, I want to say like the following year I started dancing and then I was always dancing with Agape ever since. Like that was one of the things that saved me when the breakup did happen because mm -hmm. the breakup happened. Um, calling off the engagement happened. Let me say it that way. Mm -hmm. And at that time it was, um, that was the dancing for Agape was the one thing that kept me going. Art will save you. Child, absolutely with a capital A, bolded, underlined, italicized, exclamation mark, circled. Underscore. You know, that part. All those things. <laughs> yeah, make the font real, like, 62 size. Helvetica? You know what I'm Helvetica, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll do Helvetica. Yeah. Yes, okay, yes, thank so. you. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we know what we're talking about. We are with word, okay? Uh, so... <laughs> Whatever your passion is that you get excited about is what will always save you. And not that you're counting on it to save you, but to always be in the company of that art, even if you're the one creating it, will help you to feel better um, and to be in a good mood. And if you're always doing that, then you there's no reason to like, let me do this so I can feel better. But we are in this human experience. And so things happen. And things happen in this human experience for us to want something different and want more. And that's the whole point. <laughs> um, so that is how I got into Agape. They know me as a dancer and choreographer. And after the service had to, they had to move. There was a couple floods in the building. And and I don't, there were some other things on the back end that was going in. So they ended up switching facilities. And during that move and during the pandemic, you know, most of the dancers moved away. Mm -hmm. And we had about like 12 or 15, something like that. And so there was like four or five of us left. And then two of them moved. And the, the two that moved like had all the costumes. So they gave everything to me. And, and a lot of the costumes got damaged in the flood. So a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff got damaged in those floods. But... I have everything. I'm the choreographer and, you know, it's at the Saban Theater and we get to dance on a real stage. Like, I love it. 
Oh, God, that sounds exciting. Yes. Every Sunday? Yeah, well, I don't dance every Sunday, but, like, the <laughs> service is at the Saban oh, okay. every Sunday. There's no dance. <clears throat> so how often do you guys dance during the services? Primarily when they ask, like, oh, when they okay. when they want a performance, performance or okay. for, like, a, an event or something. Like, it's okay. not – if we danced every week, we, that means we need to be in practice, like, three days a week, like – Mm, mm. I don't have my studio yet, <laughs> but that's on the way. <laughs> um, so, so Michael Beckwith has such a big reach and plays such a pivotal role in a lot of our awareness and consciousness and our awakening. Period. And you know, I would say before I'd heard of Michael Beckwith, I was actually paying attention to Dr. Wayne Dyer, who was from Michigan and Detroit, and and then I started to see this whole community of people that I would come across that were speaking a lot of the same things. And I was somehow like in there with them. Like I'm now saying the same things as well. And so, you know, the book came about, I knew, you know, Rev was very well-versed and, you know, there's a uh, university classes at Agape and I've taken a couple of those classes but, and so with all of that and just the wealth of knowledge that he has and that he knows, I did ask him if he would write the forward for me because the book not only talks about kids and performing arts, it goes into a little bit of like touching on the quantum field and understanding the energy behind thoughts and and just consciousness in and of itself and you know how to think thoughts that feel good on purpose. And it's more so from a you can call it spiritual, you can call it quantum, whatever you want to call it. It does exist. You know, mm -hmm. like we know gravity exists. There's no questioning if it exists or if it doesn't. And the same thing applies with the laws of the universe. There is the law of attraction, but there's also like, um, you know, there's there can be some people say there's 17 more, there's 20 more. There are a plethora of laws that the universe abides by, mm -hmm. honestly. So, you know, this, you know, the law of correspondence, there's, there's so many different moving particles and really understanding how to apply that into your life is why I created the book and why I asked Rev. He's such a powerful force in the spiritual world and just in the community that he's created in general. And um, he said, yes, I said, okay. So Nicole, <laughs> write the book, write, finish the book. Finish the book. Well, that's one so, way to get motivate yourself. <laughs> man, my goodness. I, I, there was a small moment of because his reach is so big of like, oh, shit, I got to write this book. Like, I got to finish. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> just just write. What are you doing? What are you writing about? Just write. And so when I was creating the book, the book is based off an on, the online program that I created. So the online program is, you know, called Start Smart for the Arts. And that is just, you know, it's a series of videos that you watch. It's about, each video is nine to 10 minutes long. And I think there's 10, 10 videos to watch. So it's not too long, not too lengthy. You can watch it on your own time. <laughs> you know, I know many parents are busy. So just, you know, watch it when you can. It is preferred that you watch it in order. <laughs> and there's worksheets to fill out. And whether you print them out, fill them out, or print them out, or just read them. The point of the worksheets are to get you thinking in a different direction than before. It's just to make you think, to help you along the path, and to to guide you along this process. Because it's a process, so just take a deep breath. Like, we're in this together. <laughs> you know, I mentioned that numerous times throughout the video. And the video was just me talking, and then I go over different principles and different things to apply within your life and then then I do go into like how to save time and money throughout this process so that way you know you're safe mm -hmm. and your little one is safe and guided correctly and so that's the online program and then from that I created the book and now the book goes into way more detail than the online program does because I'm you know you have your writing so I'm able to get all of those things out otherwise if I would have got all of this out and the program, that program would be like full five hours long. Don't nobody got time for full five hours long. <laughs> so they're, you know, they can be like a companion for each other. Absolutely. Abso the, absolutely. Because um, yeah. the book goes into a lot more, I don't want to say a lot more detail, but it goes into more detail in terms of like everyday living and how to truly um, get a grasp on what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
It sounds like this would be a good way to bond with your child too. Like absolutely these kind of activities that you talk about in the mm-hmm. book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I talk. I do go into different ways and different modalities to bond with your your little one, whoever you're supporting, mm-hmm. and it's not specifically to go into it like we're gonna bond like this it's just a different way of being Mm -hmm. in this world and so some parents don't know how to do that I mm -hmm. mean I mean parenting doesn't come with a handbook I kind of feel like parents are learning in the moment so Mm -hmm. some guidance wherever it comes from is helpful even if it's focused on art like some guidance I imagine would be helpful to parents especially first-time parents absolutely you know I even touch on how to know when you find the right teacher and coach and when you put them in the right class to, you know, how do you know when they feel comfortable and confident and Mm -hmm. different conversations to have about that, no matter what age they are. You can tell, you know, I touch on like different things that you can feel within the body to know what your little one is attempting to tell you because they don't have the vocabulary yet Mm -hmm. if they're that young, Mm -hmm. even when they're older. They don't have that vocabulary. We know adults have trouble saying things all the time. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we have a full-on vocabulary. Child. And we still struggle to yeah. express our emotions. So there, it's not that there's a process to this, but there is a process to your unfolding and your unfoldment and your growth as well as your child's growth. Because your growth, it's not that your growth is more imperative, but you are the example setter. And they're only learning, please remember, from birth to ages six to eight. And they're even learning when they're in the womb. But they're only learning through vibration and observation. Mm -hmm. And so that means they're just repeating everything that you're doing. (laughs) And that means your emotions. And most people forget about emotions. People just think that it's a physical activity or like actually speaking. But no, they're picking up on your emotions. Yeah, you can feel that. They're repeating your emotions. So if you're stressing out from work, mm -hmm, they're stressing out watching TV because you're stressing out from work. Yeah. And you're wondering why they're crying. Like, it's a whole thing. I want to touch on um, the law of attraction a little bit. The law of attraction. (laughs) So I know that you were in the pilot episode of the Late Night Experiment. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Motown chimes in. Okay, okay. And, and for those of you who don't know, the Mo- the late night experiment is Motown's comedy series streaming worldwide. <laughs> and I actually watched the entire series before he and I even met in oh, person. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's so funny. Oh my god, so entertaining. Motown is a clown. He, <laughs> he's a closet <laughs> clown. <laughs> But um, I will say my favorite episode was the episode where he is on trial mm-hmm. for misusing the law of attraction. Oh, my goodness. So clever, <laughs> yeah, though. I, was, I said the same so thing. Clever. Such a clever way to use that concept. Yes. You know? And, yeah, it's, it's you, you guys have got to watch it. It really is a funny, a funny, a funny series. Yes, he is, in my opinion, he's definitely a genius in his own right, yeah. you know, to, he, and, and to keep going and to keep doing this takes both a, of you have a level a, of perseverance yeah, that perseverance, is unlike any other. Not only perseverance, but resilience. I think those go hand in hand. I concur. We all have a level of perseverance that's already built in. It's within our guidance system. It's, you know, part of the human experience is why we have that willingness to keep going and to keep trying and to put one foot in front of the other even if you're not walking even if you're not walking you know like you see it in babies all the time Mm -hmm. you see it in babies all the time whether you or not you're paying attention (laughs) that's on you but (laughs) it is always around us you know everything is designed to grow and to move forward no matter what uh, and to change everything is designed to change and so when it comes to understanding that and the laws of the universe, the law of attraction is such a big factor. It's not the most important one, but it is such a big factor. And I want to say even before that is the law of vibration Mm -hmm. is before that because everything vibrates, right? Um, And everything changes, as I had just mentioned. But then there is the law of attraction, which is uh, that which unto like itself is drawn. So like attracts like, but it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, you know, people don't take into an account that that is how children 
learn mm -hmm. <laughs> that they're, you know, that's still a factor in how we all learn in our everyday presence to, you know, the people that we hang out with to, you can't control anything around you. But, you know, there's that saying that we were all raised with that of the world doesn't revolve around you. Right. We've heard this. Right. But in actuality, the more you study the laws of nature, it does, because that is the law of attraction. Mm. OK. And it doesn't mean that things, you know, down the street aren't going to happen or like right across the way isn't going to happen, but it just won't touch and affect you. Uh, but it all is based off of how you feel and you really understanding your own guidance system within you and your own emotions. And that is what the book really entails and talks about learning your own emotions mm -hmm. like the, I think the biggest thing for me was learning that my emotions are not the truth Ooh, that's big one and that's facts it is facts it's like, just an emotion it's, it's your guidance system it's like you can get an emotion as a reaction it's not the truth of what's truly happening mm -hmm. and when I started practicing mindfulness and slowed down and changed my um what do you call it? Internal. It's not internal. Consciousness. No, thinking. The, mm, that, that voice process. that's always talking to mm -hmm. you in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. And when I, ch my internal dialogue, mm -hmm. when I changed my internal dialogue, my life completely opened up and things got so much better. Mm -hmm. um, I So I find the law of attraction fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people talk about it. It's a very, I think it's the one of the most popular laws that people talk about. But I know, I feel like you have really had a chance to experience it working in your life. Have you studied it at all? Have you? I have. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Y'all. Absolutely. So I yeah. haven't studied it. Uh -huh. I mean, I know what it is. I kind of have an idea of how it works. But I would like to, can you share with our audience, like, can you give us like a little mini course on law of attraction? <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll, I'll start it with, it has to start like here first, in my opinion. So understanding that, you know, we all have our, you know, our five senses, like, was it sight, hearing, all the things, smell, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And once I began to understand that what you see, feel, hear, taste, touch is only 5% of what's really happening. So when you hear about a story on the news, that is 5% of what's really happening. When somebody tells you about their story, like even this interview, it's only 5% of what is really happening. So to create uh, an opinion, a strong opinion that you feel is valid, which you have every right to do so, but remember, it's only 5% of what is really happening. And so having that level of understanding, and once I really began to you know, take those classes and courses to, to understand the quantum physics of you know, how atoms move, how electrons move you know, with vibrations mm -hmm. and thoughts, and how, how that is even possible, um, it started to make more sense to how to deliberately use it and understanding that what you put out is what you get back. So that doesn't just mean the physical, like, oh, I help you bring in the groceries and somebody will help me bring in the groceries. <laughs> it does mean that, but there's so much more behind that, you know, like how you're feeling is what you're putting out into the world. So the body vibrates at a certain frequency and that frequency sends signals out. So think of it as a radio signal, like listen to the radio station. Mm -hmm. There's waves that, you know, are in the air that you just cannot see. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know y'all can't see me at home because I'm like waving my hands in the air and, you know, dancing. break dancing over here. <laughs> but uh, there's waves and things that you just cannot see. And that's how a radio station picks up. That's how you're able to turn, turn to the radio station that comes in clear. You know, and if you listen to, you know, let's say you are listening to the radio and you're on a road trip and you're driving and then you start to lose that station and it starts to become like that white noise. Mm -hmm. That white noise, if you listen to white noise long enough, it can have the ability to make you sick, which is very similar to your thoughts. If you don't take the time to quiet the mind and sit and just be, it can drive you insane. And so in terms of those those radio waves again, uh, there's the, the radio signal and 
It's not coming in clear, but once you start to hear a little bit of like singing and talking and then it starts to come in clear, you're like, okay, okay, okay. It's coming mm-hmm. in clear. I'm, I'm, we're getting a we're good station. We're getting a good station. So your thoughts and your frequency is the same way. So it's like they work hand in hand. You, you can only tune into thoughts that have the same feeling and same vice versa. So, so where do you start? Um, you decide that you always start by deciding that you just want to feel a little bit better. Mm-hmm. So that means understanding that just your emotions in general, you can go from zero to a hundred real quick. Okay. So just like your heartbeat and just like your heart beats on a regular basis at a normal resting rate, and then you start running and it goes faster and faster and faster. And then let's say you just stop running. Well, the heart still needs time to slow down, right? So your emotions are the same way. It has to, you have to go through these emotions. So you just can't go from fear to joy all of a sudden. It, there's a, there's what's called an emotional scale that I don't care who you are on this planet, even animals, you go through every single one of these emotions, period. And these things have been measured and they're like, tested and all the things, like the evidence is there, but whether you need evidence or not, you can feel it just like, you know, if you're in the house and I know I like to play pranks on people, I'm just saying, but I like to like hide behind doors and scare people or hide under the bed, do all sorts of things. I'll be hiding in the cabinet, you know, way in the corner and you're just not expecting this. So living with me is fun. It's an exciting time. (laughs) But Nicole, I do the same thing. The same nonsense. <laughs> same thing. I'm I always on a mission the for a new hiding spot. Yes. You get, you get fist pump. I think I have used Boom. them all up in this house, but I'm still going to find another one. So that means we're going to connect after this show, <laughs> y'all. And we're going to both be hiding from Motown. We're going to scare them. We're going to be like, where did they go? So, yeah, where was I saying? So even when you do little things like that, you jump out and you scare someone. Or let's say, you know, you're feeling good. Let's say you're the one that's about to get scared. You're feeling good. You're walking through the house, do, to do, to do. And somebody jumps out and scares you. Rah! Right? Because that's how they sound. And, <laughs> and, you know, it does scare you. You are startled. So you went from feeling really, really great to then being in fear. But there's an in-between part that people miss and just miss, like completely miss it all together. I went from happy to fearful. You you didn't, actually. You you went from happy and then there was a moment of like, oh my gosh, I'm in danger. There was a realizational moment, which is also a particular feeling or emotion. And then you got scared. And then once you see it's uh, Nicole hiding around the corner, then even though you might smile and be like, oh, you scared me, there's an in-between from... Now I was in fear to, there's a realizational moment of like, okay, so I'm now, I'm not in danger. So everything is okay. And now I can smile. Mm-hmm. Like that makes all the difference. Understanding that you can't go from a 90 to a hundred real quick. There's another sample of, you know, if you're standing at the top of a hill and your car's in neutral and you give it a little nudge, well, what's going to happen to that car? It's going to start rolling down the hill, Right. And as it goes down the hill, it gains momentum. And this is the law of attraction. So as it gains momentum, it does what? It goes faster and faster and faster. Well, obviously you don't want to be at the bottom of the hill because the collision may happen and it's too much power. It's too much momentum for you to stop it. And that is what we mean by like the momentum of law of attraction. Now, if you were at that top of the hill and you gave the car just a slight little nudge, and let's say you had somebody stand in front of the car, you could stop it before it gains any momentum at all. Mm -hmm. So the gotcha, gotcha is, it's not necessarily how do you stop the momentum, it's how do you stop it before it starts. Mm -hmm. And then understanding what to do when you're in it. Okay. Does that make sense? So when you're in it now, we got to leave the car analogy out of the place now, (laughs) like out of the picture. So when you're in it, It's understanding, okay, I'm pissed off. (laughs) Like so-and-so made me mad and da 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 And so that's happening, right? So you're upset. And so then what most do, not everyone, but what a lot of people have a tendency to do is to carry that mood throughout the day and not on purpose, but what you do is once you see Jim at work 
And you and Jim have like intimate conversations. So then you got to tell Jim what happened and how so-and-so pissed you off. And then later on that night, you talk to your girlfriend on the phone and then you got to tell her why you got mad and why you got pissed off. But what you're not feeling or paying attention to are the emotions and what's going on within the body. And so every time you retell that story, and if you get upset every time you tell them the story, (laughs) then you're causing the body to be in fight or flight. And even though you just think you're telling the, you know, Shaniqua the story of what happened, your body is 100% in fight or flight. And so now, you know, the only way to calm it down that you can think of is, I don't know, go to sleep or you're not even paying, you're not even aware. Most people aren't even aware of this at all. Mm -hmm. And so a good way to, number one, is to pay attention to how you feel when you're talking and bringing up certain subjects. Uh, The second thing is to go as general as you can in appreciation. So if that means that, so that means feeling into finding something to appreciate. That's very, very general. So, you know, think of, you know, I'm grateful that we have enough air to breathe in this room right now, because right now we're not taking turns sipping air. It sounds ridiculous, Mm -hmm. but it would be really ridiculous if Mm -hmm. we were running out of air and like, I sucked up all the air because I'm talking and now you guys have to go <laughs> hold your breath. So it's, it's, I mean, it sounds silly, but that's what it is, mm-hmm. you know, and understanding how to construct your thoughts in a particular way to feel good. You don't have to feel the best you're going to be because it doesn't work that way. The law of attraction just will not let you, when you're pissed, it's not going to let you go into I don't know, being grateful for I don't something real specific. Mm-hmm. You have to keep it general. And if that means I'm grateful for the sun spinning in perfect proximity to other planets so I don't float off, I'll take that. I will take that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to walk outside, take a walk. Being in, in tune with nature, I talk about that in the book and how that has the ability to calm and soothe the body. Even, you know, we do have people that are like, being outside, I don't like to be in with nature. But it will eventually calm you because of the frequency of Mother Earth. Um, so understanding those different types of modalities. And I think I started a story and maybe didn't finish it. But I think... <laughs> I got the point across, right? Yeah, you answered my question very thoroughly. Awesome sauce. <laughs> well, it's been such a pleasure. I think out of the four podcasts I've done, I think I've enjoyed this one the most. Oh, yay. Such a Thank great you. Guest. You have such good energy. Um, before we wrap up, I do. I want to say thank you again, genuinely Absolutely. bringing your full self to this conversation. And also, do you have any other projects you want to share um, that might be coming up that we can look forward to? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the online program called Start Smart for the Arts. And first of all, thank you so much for asking. <laughs> of course. Amaze everybody smile whenever I do that. <laughs> My job is complete. So... Yeah, I have the online program. Now, with the online program, it's not just an online program. There is the online program, which you can watch on your own time and um, do the work that way, right? Now, I'm also offering a four-week course. And that one, it's a little bit more money involved, but you get a whole lot more bang for your book. You know, you're going to get the the program, the book for free, not for free, but you're going to get the book and it also includes the worksheets to fill out. And these worksheets you can apply to like everyday life. It's mm-hmm. not just with the program or with you placing little Billy in baseball. But this is stuff that you are going to be able to use for the rest of your life. So it is something that's really imperative. Uh, Something else that I've got coming up is I am producing a show in which I don't know if I can say anything about it just yet. We'll just say it deals with, um, ooh, I don't know if I can even say that. How about this? I will, Motown will be the first person that is updated on the show. (laughs) And this has been in the works for three years. Okay, I created the show during the pandemic. And then, then came the process of like, all right, I need help. What am I doing? What am I doing? This is for TV. I don't know. What am I doing? I don't know. I can choreograph live stage shows easily. I've done really big shows. I've worked with Cirque du Soleil. I've worked with artists from overseas. I ain't work 
don't know. I can't produce my own TV show. This is not what I do. However, Spirit was like, yes, it is. So you need to call this person, call this person. And like I kept going through people like trial and error, trial and error. And during meditation, it came through to call a girl that I used to teach class with or teach at the same studio with for like four years. And I told her what I was doing. And she said, absolutely. Come to find out she has her own production company now. And we'll just say she's really great friends with someone that is involved in three major reality shows. I'm just going to say it that way, that we all still watch. And it's been on the air for over 10 years. So we're just going to I'm just going to say that. So um, <laughs> then started the process of doing this, uh, understanding of me understanding the, the TV game and how to pitch a show. And and as we were getting ready, then the writer strike happens. Do, 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 do. And technically, I am a writer because of the show. I wrote the show. And right. Oh, yeah. So that affects Nicole's line of work. So that's on hold right now. Yeah. But Motown will get first dibs on this show once I can say what it is. And, um, you That's, told me about it a year ago this I did? month at the reunion. You told oh me a little gosh. bit. I remember. <laughs> it's still, that's still a thing. I mean, obviously it's on hold. Like the rest of the entertainment industry was put on hold, you know, during this writer's strike. Not that everything was, but, you know, when you are on the other side and the production side, you do have to like pay attention to what's really happening and what is for your beneficial presence and what's not. So I have that coming up and then. You know, I go around to different performing arts organizations and I speak as a guest speaker. I work with the coaches and teachers to the parents and the kids. This is what I do. And I teach a lot of the things that are in the book and the program. So that is that's what I'm working on and opening a dance studio. That's kind of okay. a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> so if people want to find you. They can go to Start Smart for the arts.com mm -hmm. and arts is plural a-r-t-s a-r-t-s and it's yeah start smart and then the number four, four. and then the word the and then the word arts a-r-t-s dot com start smart for the arts dot com and then your book yep looks like she's ready are you that is on the website as well you can purchase that even if you just type that in you should still be able to find it and then there's i mean there's my personal website which everything is on but which is? That one is NicoleLeshawn.com. And that's N-I-C-H-O-L-E and then L-E-S-H-A-W-N.com. NicoleLeshawn.com. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This has been such a fun interview. It has been, yes. I've, I'm... I don't know if you can hear it, but I'm grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> I found a buddy to hide with. This is great, guys. Also good. Yeah. So we're going to. You, you guys are quietly like the same person. <laughs> we're going to kick Motown outside. We're going to hide and you can come after me count to five. <laughs> and if you can find us, we'll give you a banana because we know you love bananas. Mangoes first. Mangoes. Mango. Oh, mangoes I'm are in cool. season. I love right. me some mangoes. <laughs> mangoes. Well, I just want to say thank you to Motown for putting this together. Thank you so much, Atara, for everything. And yeah, I am thrilled and just overjoyed right now. And thank you guys so much for letting me share my story. It really means a lot. Thank you again so much for being here. Ah, with infinite love and gratitude. Absolutely. And for the folks on the airwaves, thank you for listening. So hit that subscribe button so you never have to miss a single episode of Sip and Chat Cafe.